Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at both Thomas and Pilate, a little, just a very little bit about Pilate. Connecting to God in honesty. The series has been talking about connecting to God in a variety of ways. In particular, as we relate that to our call of discipleship, to take the faith that we have and pass that on to others so that they would be equipped, enabled, uh, encouraged to pass that faith then on to another generation. Last week, we looked at Mary and Joseph and uh, connecting to God in the day-to-day. -day. That discipleship is helping people realize that Jesus isn't just a guest, but he's a resident. He becomes a member of your family, that he is a part of the decisions that you make and um, walking with him in the day-to-day. -day. And that that can be a challenging a stage for people to go from thinking about Jesus to connecting to Jesus to actually having him move into your life and why some people, especially earlier in their faith, really have a struggle with that. As you think through last week, how did you do with connecting in the day-to-day? -day? So the majority of our group has done this for a long time and that's what we're used to, but it's that reminder that that is what you're doing. What did Jesus do with last week? What decisions did he help you make? What encouragements did he provide? How did he set your schedule? What does he have planned for you this week? If I were to ask Abby what she had planned for this week, she would be able to give that to me. She has several hours of our family time that's already scheduled. Kira, not so much. But Abby, yes. So far we've looked at people connecting to God in a variety of ways. First, we looked at connecting to God through a mentor. Then we looked at connecting to God by studying the Word of God. Through the experiences in our lives, through victory, and in the day-to-day. -to -day. Today, we take a look at a couple passages about Thomas and Pilate, and I want to show how connecting to God in honesty impacts our life. Each of these have connected to discipleship. And so when we realize that Jesus is now a part of our lives, then the phase we're going to look at today is when we realize how connectable he is and that we could talk to him about anything and that the doubt and the struggle are still a part of the process, but that Jesus is okay with that. And that being a disciple doesn't mean that you've got things figured out, it just you know who you're walking with. And in each of these cases, I see a struggle with questions with a perception, with perspective, and then going to God to find an answer. Matthew, Mark, and Luke provide us with no information about Thomas. All we know from them is that he was one of the twelve. Each of the gospel writers only mentioned Thomas in the listing of the twelve apostles, so we have to look at John, the gospel of John, to find the power of connecting to God in honesty. Not much is known about Thomas other than we know that he was a twin because of Thomas Didymus. And Didymus is the term for twin. We know that he was a part of the Twelve, but other than that, we don't know anything about him except what John brings forth. <coughs> when we think about Thomas, we often think of a term that comes before his name, and that is doubting Thomas. That's what he's often called, doubting Thomas. And even, and this event in his life is so well known that anyone does, who does not believe the testimony of others is called a doubting Thomas. Now we get to the important part. The girls and I enjoy the movie Chicken Little. Maybe even a little too much. Abby saw the picture upstairs when I was getting the sermon ready and she just started line after line. And do you remember? And then there was this. Out of the four of us, Naomi, not so much. We have many of the lines memorized, and the thought of it just makes us laugh. A main point of the movie revolves around the fact that nobody trusts him anymore. That one mistake now characterizes his life. And what do you do when all the people do when they think about you is you're the guy that said the sky would fall. And so he's trying to repair his reputation except it doesn't quite work. But the movie's pretty funny. His statement of doubt comes from his honesty. That's what I think we need to connect to with Thomas. Yes, there was doubt, 
with Thomas, but that came from a place of honesty and that when we think about it, we should think of it in more of a positive context than in a negative. Because it's all from John, in John chapter 11, the first time that we read about the connection to Thomas is actually at the death of Lazarus. In verse 5 it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there where he was for two more days. Verse 7 it says, Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there. Then in verse 13 it says, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Let us go with him that we may die with him. If that statement had come from Peter, we may have thought it a little presumptuous or or hot-headed. If you're going to die, I'm going to die. But Thomas seems to be speaking out of loyalty and honesty. It seems to me that what Thomas is saying is this. Jesus, if you're willing to put your life at risk, then we should put ours at risk also. Does that kind of make sense? So that's really a statement of faith. If you're going and you're going to die, then let us join you in that. The message translates it this way. Come along, we might as well die with him. Does that sound like a doubting Thomas to you? He's the first one that says to the group, he's going to get in trouble, don't let him go alone. I don't see it as pretense. I see a man who's being honest. Honest connection is necessary for his disciples. People need to know that they're connecting, who they're connecting to, and what is expected of them. Having doubts and questions is a part of an honest relationship with Jesus and an honest connection to his followers in the church. Thomas is showing what he is thinking of and where his loyalties are. As he connects with God, he is open and honest. I see this honesty in other passages that mention Thomas. A little farther on in in John chapter 14, here the honesty of Thomas may be contagious. Thomas is in a situation where he doesn't understand what's going on or what Jesus is talking about. So instead of pretending to look good in front of the others and pretending to be more spiritual than he is, he just asks a question. He's confused. And it's likely that the others are as well, but it's Thomas that speaks up. In John 14, 1 through 8, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. That was a statement, by the way. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And the others are like, okay. But Thomas says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how how can we know the way? I don't know. I don't know where you're going. I don't know what's up. How do you expect us to know what's going on here? But he's the one that speaks up. And then we get the part of the passage that we like, that we understand, because it's Jesus' reply. But if Thomas doesn't ask the question, are the next verses missing? Thought of that? Because the assumption is, you know where I'm going. Yes, we do. And that's where it ends. But Jesus replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Thomas honestly did not know what Jesus was talking about. So I think he asked this question for clarification. How can we know the way? This is all a little too...
confusing for Thomas. And it seems that he needs a little processing time. So that leads then Philip to ask another question. But what's your tendency when you get confused? Has anything in your faith ever confused you? Any understanding about God? Any questions about why, why do we do what we do? Why does this church do that? Or these people do this? Or what's expected of me next? Or you just got it all figured out? See, how we handle confusion in the general areas is often how we handle confusion in the spiritual areas as well. When confused, some people just quit. I'm confused, I don't know, that's it. There's something I don't know, check it off the list. Some people, when it gets hard, they give up. They don't want to do the struggle, they don't want to try to figure it out. Some people work harder to figure it out on their own. Some people rely on others to figure it out so they can rely on the direction of others. And some people actually ask for clarity and help. Think about you doing homework back in the day. What was your process? What's your tendency with the things in life that confuse you? That tendency will likely carry over to how you deal with confusion in your spiritual life as well. And disciples of Jesus need to connect in honesty and say, I don't understand this. So let me find other people. Who do I talk to? What other passages? Let's spend some time in prayer. I don't understand that. And maybe I won't understand it, but I need to work this through. Thomas honestly doesn't know what Jesus is talking about. And so he stops and he asks. Well, what are some reasons why he might not have asked? What are some reasons why we may just quit in the process? He may be embarrassed by the others. Thomas, you're always asking stupid questions. He may be the only one who doesn't seem to get it, and so he could feel self-conscious. But whatever's going on inside his head, he takes the step and he asks. Because what's more important with Thomas? How they see him or being right with God? That it's worth the struggle. That I don't understand this. Or I think I understand it. Isn't that kind of sometimes worse? And not checking back in with Scripture and God and others? But he wants to be right with God more than he's concerned about being embarrassed or self-conscious. So he asks. The last passage in John that talks about Thomas is the one where we get the doubting Thomas part. In John 20, 19 through 31, as we read it, I want to think of the honesty that it would have taken to actually say this out loud. Not to just think it or feel it, but to say it. And there's some other parts that we might have missed as well. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After, this, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What did he do? They were gathered together. And what's the action of Jesus in this? In front of these people, he shows his hands and he shows his side. Well, this side, because of the heart. You see, Jesus takes the action in this. This little bit here, we don't know the whole context, but it shows that Jesus takes the action to identify himself. Verse 24 tells us, That, Jesus, uh, that Thomas wasn't here. So in 21 to 23, it says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. See that discipleship connection? And after he had breathed on them, he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Is that an important part? If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But there's a part in here, verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, again mentioning that, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So what did he not receive? 
The Holy Spirit was not breathed on him the same as the other, and he didn't get the same commission. And he did not receive the, if you forgive them, they'll be forgiven. Doesn't mean that they were kept from him, but he wasn't a part when it was given to the others. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Probably in a rejoicing way, not, we've seen the Lord, you did not which some people might do. But guess what you missed? And Thomas might have been the servant kind of guy that was out getting burritos or something. I don't know. But why did he miss it? doesn't say. He missed it, and the others have this experience, and they say, we've seen the Lord. But then there's the line that we peg him with. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. He said that. He didn't just think it. He said, you know that it was God. I wish that I knew that it was him. Here's what I think that I would need to know for sure that it was him. So in verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, which can mean just closed, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Who says this? Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. When Jesus identified himself to the disciples before Thomas was there, what did he do? He showed him his hand in his side. So when he meets with Thomas, what does he do? He shows him his hand in his side, and he says, do you want to touch it? Don't doubt me. Do you want to touch it? So what's Thomas' next answer? What did he say that he needed to believe? Unless I touch you, unless I put my finger in that hole, I'm not going to believe it. But when given the opportunity and God's there in front of him and Jesus is showing the wounds in verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Did Thomas say, okay, poke, poke, poke. Well, I guess it is you. When it, he had the chance, he said, no, I don't need it. I don't need it. I thought I needed it. I don't need it. You are my Lord and my God. That's enough for me. And then that statement is what connects on to some people have seen, and that's why they believe. What about those that won't have the chance to believe, to see? Are they going to believe? Blessed are those. Because that's the bigger majority, right? Verse 30, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's the transition to, there were lots of other evidences which is the point of John's gospel. God has given us enough reason to believe, and he uses a word there that says, not only start believe, but keep on believing. But it's the transition from the discussion with Thomas that brings up the bigger concept. Thomas did not think he could believe unless he saw the Lord and touched him. I think that came from an honest source. What do you think? That he said, you guys got to see that. His heart was heavy at the loss of Jesus, so me, he may have felt honestly, and honestly felt that if he didn't get to experience Jesus in that way, he wouldn't believe. Do I have enough belief just to believe in your word? Was he really saying, I would have liked to have been there too. Instead of denying that he felt that way, he shared his doubt. And when he did, he encountered Jesus in a way that he thought that he needed. 
But that wasn't necessary. He finds out that he has reason to believe without actually touching him. Because he's given the opportunity to come to Jesus in a different way. And his answer is equally honest that time. My Lord and my God. Verse 20, it says that Jesus had shown the others his side and his hands. Maybe that's what they needed as well. It doesn't say, but it could be that some of those touched him, right? When they had the opportunity. And Peter comes back and he says, you see this? That was Jesus. And Thomas says, well, unless I get to do that, we won't have that option. We'll have to believe on the testimony of others and the work of the Spirit, but when we connect to God in honesty, it impacts us and it impacts others around us. When we say, there's things about life I don't understand, that's why I go to church. There's things in the Bible I don't understand, that's why we study it. There's things about my faith that I'm confused about, that's why I keep working on it. You see how that impacts other people rather than displaying that we got this all figured out? but saying this is a process. That honesty is important for disciples of Christ. And that's a part of the discipleship that passes on. To say to other people, you can work on this too. Here's people in a place and a way to figure things out. See, Jesus is approachable today. Amen <laughs> and hallelujah. That God, Jesus himself, has opened himself up to whatever doubts you have. When we have doubts or questions, we can go to God and encounter him in honesty. So we share with God what's on our heart. And we talk to others, and they lead us back to Scripture, and we talk about it, and we pray about it. We can tell them our concerns, our joys, our questions, and take the time to lay it out before the Lord. When we approach God with this honesty and vulnerability, we grow in ways that are unimaginable as we take on the call of the Great Commission. This is honest faith, not Sunday-only faith. This is an honest faith that says, I have questions and I have a relationship. I go to God because he's constantly approachable. He's big enough to handle my concerns. Even the concerns we have about the Great Commission, about going and making disciples. Thomas teaches us that honesty, but Pilate teaches the same honesty in a different way. See, Pilate has a struggle with being honest and actually following it through. Thomas is honest, and he has a way to follow it through. Pilate knows what's right, but he can't get himself to do it. But he asks some honest questions, too. Pilate's connection to Jesus comes from a different struggle with honesty. We're going to look at two main statements by Pilate, but if you're interested in more, I have another sermon that I did just about Pilate that gives the background about Pilate, about where his struggles and where he came from and the history and why he may have not been able to do what he wanted to do. So I brought that as well if you want a copy of that. It's also on the online version, the Word document of it. Pilate struggles with doing what's right, what he knows is right, or following the crowd. In John 18, 37 through 39, page 1683, we read of Pilate in an honest struggle about what to do with Jesus. He wants to release him, and he comes up with several ways to do it, but he can't sway the crowd because they want to put Jesus to death. So it's in this dialogue of knowing what's right and trying to find a way, well, what if I just flog him? No, we want him killed. Well, but there's no reason, but we want him killed. But what about, no. How about if I release Barabbas? Let me release a prisoner. How about Jesus? No, we don't want him. So the crowd keeps pushing back because Satan's involved. But it seems like he honestly wants to let him go. Pilate has a dialogue with Jesus. John records it this way. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth 
listens to me. This is a convicted criminal, somebody that they brought to him just for sentencing, but Pilate brings him aside to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus makes the comment, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Why does he do that? Because he knows what Pilate's struggling with. Pilate then says a very classic line, what is truth? Does that sound like a pretty honest question? I'm supposed to be guiding the nation. I'm supposed to be taking care of this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what truth to believe in. If I let you go, it's the end of my political career. Could be the death of my family. What's truth? And with this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Which, in a sense, is saying, may I? I have a suggestion. People today can be caught up in the same struggle and confused in their search for truth and its impact. But you are there to help them come to know Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. That's why we're in their lives. Because people are still struggling with this question, what is truth? Can you trust anything? Can you? There's so much confusion. Is there a path in life? Can the Bible be trusted? That's why we're in people's lives, is to help guide them back to Jesus, who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Matthew also records a section about Pilate. Another perspective of the encounter with Jesus. He also is the one that talks about the dream that was given to Pilate's wife. In Matthew chapter 27, 23 through 26, page 1547, we read of Pilate that he wants nothing to do with the death of Jesus. He washes his hands of the blood that has been and will be shed. Because he knows once he turns him over, he's going to be crucified. He's already had him flogged, so he has blood on his hands from that. That action of washing the blood provides the opposite effect. Since we know it's the blood of Jesus that would have provided him with the innocence and the peace of mind that he was really looking for. This is a statement that is so strong, if he knew what he was saying, he wouldn't have said it, right? He goes to the people and says, why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar, um, uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, it is your responsibility. In that, he was saying, I honestly do not think that he is guilty and I, have, I want nothing to do with the death of this innocent man. But the people make a statement, a very impactful statement. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Let his blood be on us and our children. Jesus' death on the cross and the shedding of his blood as a willing and perfect sacrifice makes us make the same request for Jesus' blood to be on us and on our children, on our city, in our country, on every person of every country, because we need to connect to the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Connecting to Jesus in honesty involves his sacrifice and sharing the good news that forgiveness is available to everyone. Pilate didn't really know what he was saying. And he could have reversed it and said, let his blood be on me and my family, if he knew that it had provided that innocence. Thomas may have had his doubts, but he took his doubts to God. So how's your relationship with God? What do you talk to the Lord about? How open are you before the Lord? Pilate struggled with making the connection to Jesus instead of being swayed by the crowd, which reminds us how or where are you honestly at with Jesus? What do we do when we're, doubt, when we're confused? How is God involved in this day-to-day -day process of talking through life?
the application of this is pretty open. This week, take some time to express your concerns, your fears, your frustrations, and your failures with the Lord. He knows it, so be honest. Turn them over to God, and when we do, we often find that what we thought we needed, we don't really need. What we need is to give it to God. Connecting with God in honesty, and when we do, he'll transform our life, and he'll use it to spread the good news as we go and make disciples. See, because then we know that we have a faith that is valuable. We have a process that is important. That's not about working it all out. It's about sharing God so that people can develop a relationship with him as well. So all of this connects to discipleship. And honesty is an important aspect. 